After coming from an agency background, I saw how a really small, nimble team can create a lot of output that has value. Over the last few years, we've, we've actually kept our outsourcing of marketing, marketing support pretty low, mostly because we have an in-house team that does a lot of it. And that's had a lot of trade-offs from not having media vendors, PR firms, social media strategy. It keeps our overheads really low. It keeps my marketing budget pretty low, which is great. In this episode, I'm talking to Thomas Winstonley, CMO of Theory Wellness, a leader in the cannabis industry, selling exclusively through retail in the East Coast of North America. We're going to talk about number one, their top three to four marketing channels, in particular, their number one channel and why it works so well in the medical cannabis industry. Number two, their LTV, lifetime value of a customer, is almost three to six times larger than the industry standard. Most of their competitors are seeing one thousand dollars LTV per customer whereas they are seeing somewhere close to three sometimes even six thousand LTV number three we're gonna dive into the company's philosophy when it comes to partnerships and why they chose to ignore and avoid partnerships since day one and lastly we're gonna try to figure out things like their annual sales how much you're spending in marketing number three how much Thomas makes as the CMO of the company and every time you can answer a question we both have to take a shot of hot sauce wish me luck Martians hope you enjoy this one Hello, hello, Martians. Welcome back to another episode of Marketing on Mars. Today, we got Thomas Winstanley. He's currently the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer of a company called Theory Wellness. Essentially, they are the industry leaders on the East Coast selling cannabis exclusively through retail. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. We had a brief conversation last week. Uh, we talked about, we, I think we talked about almost almost an hour just, <laughs> just talking about marketing. So I'm super excited to <laughs> finally be able to record with you. Um, you're currently you're currently based uh, East Coast, right? Yeah, I'm I'm in Western Massachusetts actually, um, right by the border of New York State. Um, Massachusetts is where we have kind of the central hub of all of our operations. Mm, nice. And so are you all across, like how many different cities are you guys selling uh, uh, into in the East Coast? Yeah, so right now we have a total of 12 stores. We have four across Massachusetts um, that includes both medical and recreational cannabis, cannabis. We have a fifth store opening probably in the next two to three months. We have five retail stores in Maine, one in Vermont, one in Ohio, one we're building out in Trenton, New Jersey for medical um, and then we have a big project we're working on up in New Hampshire um, and in Mass, Maine and Vermont, we're vertically integrated, which means that we make the products and we sell them through our retail. So um, we've got a lot happening and it's been a lot of growth in the last five years um, since I've been with the company, which is awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we're going to dive into the company a little bit more and your background. Your background is, is, is quite incredible. So we're going to dive into that. But before we do all of that, there's a little bit of a tradition on the show, and you know what's happening. We're going to be starting off the show with a shot of hot sauce. I got a little bit of a wall behind me here, so we'll yeah. start light on the left side and go closer. Uh, and then every single time we uh, throughout the the podcast, I'm going to try to ask you tough tough questions. We just want to figure out the secrets. How did Theory Wellness grow to the to the to the state that you guys are at now? And every single time you can't answer a question, we take a shot of hot sauce and then we'll move on. Uh, so what weapon do you have for us today? Like, What, what are you going to kill yourself yeah. with today? Yeah. So I honestly haven't been looking forward to this part of the conversation. But um, actually, funny enough, I have to give a lot of love. Um, not iron unironically, uh, Mule Sauce, which is actually from a vendor that we love called Sticker Mule. These guys actually... Uh, we order a ton of stickers from them, everything from like goofy gag stickers all the way through to packaging pieces. And they surprise and delight with mm. a like pretty decent hot sauce that um, I've been a big fan of. And it's always around in the office. Um, so I'm going to stick with a tried and true favorite of mine. Okay, cool. Can you show it to us? Yeah. One time? Just, just a label? Mule sauce. And so I can buy it too? I'm in Canada. Would uh, I be able to buy it? 
Honestly, I have no idea who they white label with, but it's literally when we buy okay. X amount of stickers, they throw a bottle of hot sauce as a surprise and delight kind of add on, which is the oh, last thing you would expect nice. from a sticker company. Um, but it's like yeah. actually really fantastic. Everything from pizza okay. onwards, it works. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to start off with Habanero. Got this sauce from Cancun. Um, <laughs> no affiliations. I'm just giving them free love. So yeah, let's, <laughs> let's get it. Do you have a shot glass or? I have a, I have a shot glass today. I, I don't have any shot glasses. I have a spoon if that counts. Yep, that's okay. I will start with shot glass. I think I might support a little bit more. All right. All right, so I got to do this first one okay. with you, correct? Ready? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cheers. Pop this off. All right. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Mm, man. <laughs> How often do you do, you, do you do this? Oh, man. Once a week. I, I used to do uh, three times a week, and my doctor recommended. Um, against <laughs> <them>. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is worse than tequila. Damn. All right. Yeah, uh, I do have I do have tequila in case we want to switch things up, but uh, for now we'll stick to that. <laughs> Fair. Um, all right. All right. Before we before we dive into the company, we'd like to learn a little bit about you first. I've gone sure. through your LinkedIn. Um, so I'm just gonna go qu do a quick run through, and then you will jump in and save me because uh, you'll know yourself a lot better. So looks like through your LinkedIn. You started off kind of in sales, like account executive, account manager. So it looks like you were in sales roles for a various variety of different companies, including the Brooklyn Brothers, which I think, is that a suit, suiting company? No, that's confused with Brooks Brothers. Um, yeah, so actually, oh, we, these okay. are all, these are actually all ad agencies. Um, and so early, <sighs> I'll just add the color now. When I first started my career in advertising in New York, I went and started working in pharmaceuticals, which was the first job I ever had, which is obviously back in 2011, mm. super highly regulated. Um, but it was an incredible learning experience to cut chops against some of the highest stakes in terms of marketing and advertising. Oh, man. So these companies, um, <laughs> yeah, it's just like burned all the way down like scotch, but no it's, fun. I feel it. I feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I started working in pharmaceuticals and um, not big, mm. you know, vanity pharma, but it was high level disease states. I worked on, you know, a blockbuster hepatitis B drug. I worked on um, uh, two different Pfizer products. And then, um, you know, kind of some of the movements were was enjoying pharma at a small shop, wanted to go to a big shop, worked mm. on big pharma. I worked on Humira, which was at the time one of the largest advertisers in the country. They had a half a billion dollar media spend, learned some great ropes, got tired of pharma, realized I wow. wasn't interested, moved into consumer packaged goods, worked on Tampax for a while. That was really interesting. Then I moved into Brook, uh, the Brooklyn Brothers um, and there I worked on Sam Adams. I worked on Remy Martin, got really into the spirits category and then transitioned to mm -hmm. a boutique tech startup uh, backed by Russell Simmons is a uh, venture capital group, worked on Under Armour, um, got a lot of great looks when I was there, learned a ton. Wow. Then, I'm, then I moved out west and worked on anti-tobacco campaigns with like a really small agency in Laramie, Wyoming, or in Cheyenne. Um, they were oh. awesome. Yeah. And so then moved back east, got my first job out of advertising with uh, one of the largest uh, retreat centers in North America. Was there for about six mm. months and then theory came along and, you know, took all of the skills I learned working on and solving problems for different brands and companies of all sizes and just pretty much wrapped them up around theory. And that's led to kind of where we are today in some respects. Wow. So you went, so you went back East 2018, you spent like, what, like nine years almost out, outside and then you came back and now mm -hmm. you've just been been in Boston ever since, Massachusetts ever since. 
Yeah. And I actually grew up in the area and um, was funny because I, one of the founders I actually knew from when I was in high school, it's a smaller area here wow. in the Berkshires. Um, Nick, our, <laughs> one of the co-founders, he and I were the same year in high school. We crossed paths a couple of times and then professionally all of a sudden kind of looped back when they were looking for someone to come on board for their marketing. And um, mm. I had known one of the investors. And as soon as the job came up as a fan of cannabis, he was like, Thomas, you've got to go apply for this job. I think you'd be a great fit. Interviewed on, I think it was like my 31st birthday. I interviewed with them and got the offer the next day. And the rest is history, as they say. All right. So if we're doing some quick math here, 31, and you started five years ago, you're 36? <laughs> yeah, right exactly. Yeah, I'm 36. Some, some quick math? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And so you've been at Theory Wellness ever since. Let's 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 try to give some, some love to Theory Wellness. So uh, try to understand a little bit about the company, the sure. scale that you guys are at. So I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, you know, spicy questions just to get a get get a sense of how large a company is at. Um, is is it fully bootstrapped? You mentioned that you knew you knew one of the founders. Uh, you were really close with them, but uh, company fully boots uh, bootstrapped, or did they raise any any money? Yeah. So early on, when they were applying, when they were kind of getting off the ground in Massachusetts, they brought together a few million dollars from friends and family just to kind of kickstart, uh-huh. and that got us off the ground. And then from there. Um, we've been profitable for, you know, four to five years, probably four years um, since then. And mm. all of the revenue and we've generated, it gets reapplied back into our company. So, you know, we haven't had to go into any debt financing or venture capital or private equity, or we've steered very clear of that. And something that does set us apart in certain ways is that we're still privately owned and operated. And maintaining that level of wow. independence has really allowed us to scale to where we are today without having a lot of, you know, tethers, red tape and anything that might restrict us yeah. from that growth. And so that nimbleness and that control has has really let us create this brand that we've, you know, that we've all been dreaming of ourselves for a long time. Wow. Do you know exactly how much they raised? I don't. In the early beginnings before they started? No, I can only say. Why, why do you look so nervous, man? It's <laughs> like I mean, I was like, I thought that was going to be enough to cover it, but oh, you had to ask the follow up too. Yeah. Oh man, I'm I'm sorry. Okay, all right. I guess we'll we'll start off with a with a light little light little hot sauce down. It's a little uh, pick me up here. Okay, great. Oh shoot! I think I poured too much. I'm gonna I'm gonna over pour so I can continue to sip on this. <laughs> like a cocktail like a cocktail there you go yeah it's, it's right. almost five o'clock here on the east coast so you're good cheers yeah cheers mm. it was mm. a little better the second time around yeah yeah you kind of get used to it mm-hmm <laughs> Don't faint oh. on me, just as long as you don't oh. faint. Actually, if you faint, I think we might get like a hundred thousand views. <laughs> yeah, if you do, views will so definitely go up. All right, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Oh my god. All right, so a light raise. Um, not a lot of red tape because obviously mostly through uh, family and friends. And you've been there for the last five years, and you've seen kind of the progression. Um, and you've you've been owning the marketing budget since since day one. Basically, yeah. right? Because you were a director of marketing from day one. Yeah. So I've I've always so Nick, who I mentioned earlier, um, I work really close. So Nick Friedman and Brandon Pollock are the two founders. They're college roommates. Um, we're kind of mm. part of the same generation um, and millennial run. And we've, you know, they've I've worked really closely with Nick, who, you know, he was started as a CFO, but he's kind of one of those guys who can do everything. He's the consummate entrepreneur. He really, really understands. The vision he creates the vision and i do a lot of the execution of what he envisions for the future right. of where we want to go and so from early on i worked directly for him and he and brandon kind of they're kind of trade out on certain areas but they really allowed me to kind of build the engine over time um, and that's required everything from standing up 
basic infrastructure, getting a lot of really good best practices. Um, and really early on in my time with them, I, after coming from an agency background, I saw how a really yeah. small, nimble team can create a lot of output that has value. And so we've, over the last few years, we've, we've actually kept our outsourcing of marketing, um, marketing support pretty low, mostly because we have an in-house team that yeah. does a lot of it. And that's had a lot of trade-offs from not having to buy media vendors, PR firms, social media strategy. It keeps our overheads really low. It keeps my marketing budget pretty low, which is great. And um, mm -hmm. we have a really rock star team. And those guys really allowed me to kind of take that approach into creating our channels. And so far, it's been you know, it's a, been a really wild ride to be able to put that infrastructure in and watch it grow and thrive. Um, it's a very different yeah. kind of, I mean, that's one of the benefits. That's one of the benefits of uh, coming from agency, right? You've, mm -hmm. you've built so many teams for big companies. You mentioned some of the, the, the big names that you run marketing for and running all the media spend for. Mm -hmm. And now with all that experience, you can build an in-house team. That's usually you're saving probably 50, 60%. In, in terms of cost, maybe even more sometimes, depending yeah. on where you're building your team. So no question. Um, that's yeah. why a lot of, a lot of people say, a lot of people say like, if you don't know what to do, start an agency. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that was exactly it. Like working on the pharma side, it was, you had very restrictive channels. You couldn't do a lot of online advertising similar to cannabis industry today. So there's a lot of analogies between the two of them that really helped me with this job. But then even working with the likes of Remy Martin, I mean, we're talking a very massive North American portfolio that had, you know, PR agency, social agency, and we were the hub of the hub of that wheel. And so, you know, as brand managers, by default, we got this kind of this really holistic picture. And every different account that I worked on, I learned a little bit about business strategy, where their gaps were, what services were needed. And so theories kind of allowed me to kind of distill a lot of that into creating an ecosystem where really early on it was two stores. So when they hired me, we had two med stores in Massachusetts and um, recreational sales were coming, you know, within the next year. And so they brought me on to build that infrastructure, knowing there was going to be a really large influx and that there was going to be a pretty aggressive growth period following it. So that allowed me to build this base infrastructure of all really good discipline fundamentals and then drive a really strong market strategy that was uh, really heavy on earned media to accelerate as much growth as possible. Yeah. yeah. So you've been at Theory Wellness for five years now. In the last five years, performance marketing has evolved quite a bit from CPC costs going through the roof during COVID in 2020 to mm -hmm. then third-party cookies kind of being obliterated. Talk to us about where you've seen, in the, especially specifically in theory wellness, how has marketing evolved for you? <laughs> yeah, so it's really funny that you bring those those points up because one, as a cannabis company, we are not able to buy AdWords. We are not able to do paid social. Our channels for marketing and yeah. advertising are a very narrow window for performance marketing. And so mm -hmm. that's required us to take a little bit of a different approach in terms of architecting that brand visibility. So paid media has always been something that we use as a supplement to prime as a supplemental driver to primary initiatives. A lot of our mm -hmm. focus has been on earned media revenue uh, generation through unique activations, unique projects and industry leading um, initiatives that started to set us apart and carrying that way forward as a really nimble outside the box organization has compounded that on top of that too. I think when we talked, you know, I profess my love for, um, SEMrush, uh, SEO yeah. has been a yeah. massive yeah. driver for us where we don't have the luxuries of using Shopify's or WooCommerce. We're using native cannabis platforms and building tech stacks off of emerging, marketing solutions in the cannabis space and fortunate for us due to our size and scale, we've had really strong relations with these vendors to help craft their UI, UX, give really detailed feedback mm -hmm. on their um, SaaS platforms and kind of build the architecture that we want as operators. And so 
over, you know, I think over the last five years, that's been a critical focus where all traditional marketing game plans don't really apply in certain areas. Um, yeah. And getting that really hyper-focused goal on, you know, strong conversion rates on our website, getting it really well indexed, and then also continuing to make products and build a brand that we know people will go come away with and really enjoy. I mean, marketing is only as good as your products are and the products I were surrounded by incredibly talented production teams. So all of these in the mix really worked well. And especially during this kind of new age of cannabis where we do not get the luxury of a lot of channels that traditional marketers do. And so I actually found myself going back to my old pharma playbooks, which were case in point where you couldn't do digital advertising. And so we, you know, I revisit a lot of those notes from back in the day and it really starts with a good strategy, really strong execution and um, making sure that we're, we stay top of mind, everything from packaging design to retail design to web design. It all feels, we try to make it feel as cohesive as possible. And that's, that's really, I think, yeah. helped us, has been a big catalyst for us on the marketing front. Yeah, so earned so earned media, SEO, those seem to be like your guys' secret sauce, right? Like you said, PPC just doesn't work in your mm-hmm. space because it's so heavily regulated. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can try and you'll probably get shut down really quick by Google, right? Yeah, uh, and I mean, Facebook, and pe- all the platforms. Yeah, and people are doing it today. And so I'm, it's not to say that it's not, it's impossible, but it toes a line of this black hat strategy that is somewhat, yeah. I'm not super comfortable with, both from a regulatory standpoint, but also yes. because I don't need Google to blacklist our name at any point. Um, and we want to be very, very sensitive yeah. to a multitude of regulations between so many states in which these these types of campaigns are not super adopted. They're not adopted yet by regulators. So, um, but they're out there, yeah. but yeah, we, we're very disciplined. We stay very disciplined on what we can control. So if you, yeah. So if you think about your marketing channels as a CMO, you got SEO, earned media, you guys do a lot of events. It would events be another category in terms of that you spend in marketing. Also, placement in retail retail stores that also costs money is that also do you consider that a channel as well yeah so certainly so a couple of things in there so on the event front we as a vertical operator we wholesale products so there is a b2b aspect to our business in which we're trying to solicit as much you know sales from other operators in the state and so we have one engine working there sometimes there's an event component um on you know the general events we we try to do events occasionally so last week i was in a patient education event in ohio to meet with Mm. prospective medical patients in that market and teach them about what medical cannabis can be and how to get a card and all these things um and then Mm. more broadly like we love to do interesting sponsorships and nonprofit work and that's another kind of event focused channel whereas we donated a food truck to a food pantry in one of the markets that we're in where there's a pretty clear food desert. We help bridge a gap between a food pantry and the constituents of this municipality who couldn't get to the food pantry. Important question. What did the was the food pantry laced with cannabis? <laughs> no, no. No, not not this one at least. Uh, <laughs> that would be quite a novel concept though. Um, no, but you know, th- those kind of <laughs> activations are awesome because all of a sudden, you know, we, whenever we open up a new store, we inherit the issues of that, you know, we inherit the challenges for our staff, the people who shop with us. And so we do a lot of nonprofit yeah. work on the event side. Um, and then we just do random mm. stuff. That's really fun. We just, uh, just, uh, two weeks ago, we opened up, um, we partnered and produced a art show of the work of Ralph Steadman that showed a bunch of early works from him unseen to the public with uh, Hunter S. Thompson. And we partnered with like a 250 year old institution that is renowned for its hospitality. They'd never done anything in the cannabis space. We worked with them. Actually, we worked with Post Malone's dad and his production team and put this event together. And so, you know, again, wow. a really interesting project, really good press. A really nice opportunity to find synergy and alignment 
Um, and then the last one you asked about was retail. And retail is one of those channels that I think over time, we've actually watched this very strong resilience in retail where everybody thought after COVID, everything was going to go online, pre-order. It's still delivery hasn't really come to fruition in our markets. Um, it exists, but people choose not to use it. I think because they like a retail experience and ours are, you know, aspirational, but also accessible. Um, and that's a nice balance that we have because we fully control the space and we have incredible staff who work for us. We have an incredible retail team who know our products, who know how to talk to patients or guests. And we have a, you know, we have a, an ask nicely score, which is one of the a net promoter score of about 87 to 90 that fluctuates between all of our stores. And we've seen well over wow. a million guests within our stores, which is also another kind of piece for us to, to make sure that we're adhering to. So all of these things are, yeah. you actually have to put a lot more focus on these types of channels compared to traditional marketing where you're doing A-B exactly. tested, getting ROAS and really looking at that. And we still track a lot of, when we do any media spends, we're tracking ROAS, but we're more specifically looking at our customer lifetime values and understanding what our buying habits are and making sure that we're staying very well educated on what the guests are looking for um, when they come into a store. So that continues to be a very, very strong channel for us. Yeah. It, it seems like we, we had a, you guys are the second cannabis uh, brand to come on the show. We had Wana Brands come on. Uh, you're probably familiar with Wana Brands that came on, Yeah, I want to say four months ago. And I love the space. Um, one because I'm also I'm also, you know, an ally of the cannabis space. Mm -hmm. But number two, I think it yeah. really comes back to just the basics of marketing, which is building a brand and, and 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 connecting with the community and just talking about it in different channels. Yeah, you don't have a short. You don't get a shortcut where you pay money and you get thrown onto the top of uh, uh, of of ads. Like, there's no shortcut. With, yeah. You just got to build a brand. And that's why I love it so much. Um, yeah. So what would you say you guys spend in terms of marketing now? Because everything is all about brand build, building with events, B2B events, and a lot of SEO and earned media, which you don't pay for. But it's just like constantly connecting with the community over time. Like, What would you say is your average monthly or annual marketing budget? Yeah, so I'm going to give you a pretty gray, gray answer on this, which is we're probably, we're, you know, about less than 1% of revenue goes out of marketing um, and comparing that to traditional mm -hmm. CPG. So we're both CPG and retail, which yeah, both yeah. fluctuate between percentage of spend. But again, we operate so much more like a startup that we try to keep our, our margins really, really high. We try to keep our costs low. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've been fortunate to not have to go down that route of what a lot of CPG products or retail products are, which is paying for attention. Um, and it's not, it's easy to say this in the cannabis industry, but I always had the sense and my founders agree with this is that it's, you know, if we're building a brand where I have to pay a ton of money for you to care about us, we're probably not building the brand we all want. And right. so... Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why we are so meticulous about the shopping experience. We're really meticulous, meticulous about our packaging, our brand hierarchies. And so that also in turn, because we're not outsourcing a ton of ad spend, we're not outsourcing a ton of vendors, we're not outsourcing a lot of the work because we're so we're, we do so much in house that that helps us keep our, our pricing, our, our spend really low. Again, that's not to say that we don't spend money on media, which we, we do, but we have to have a very good reason to. And that reason has to be backed by a really good ROAS. It has to be really well vetted. Um, and it really has to be a part of a bigger strategy, but it's never the focal point of any strategy. And so that's where we've traditionally kept our spends really, really low. Um, and honestly, we have I have an incredible team here working with me at these offices. So. Um, yeah, about 1%, probably a little less. Yeah. And just for the folks at home that are listening that might not be familiar, 
for a CPG type brand or, or, or any like DTC or like kind of a retail product, one that's like usually you're about 15%, right? 10 to 15% yeah. of revenue, yeah. maybe even higher. Yeah, right? definitely. So 1% is extremely, extremely low. All right. You didn't give us a number, but maybe we can talk <laughs> about revenue. Since it's 1% of revenue, what, what's your guys' revenue right now? Oh man, yeah. So that I I can't share, but it's well in the it's well up there in the eight figures. Um, so it's about as that's about as far as eight, I can eight, take it. Eight. Okay, so eight figures is ten million or ninety million. <laughs> so so somewhere like, in that spectrum. Yeah. Somewhere in that spectrum. Yeah. I, I've yeah. heard online. I'm gonna probe one one more probe. Um, I've heard online that you guys are doing some somewhere between like 40 50 million yeah revenue. i can neither confirm nor deny those numbers but it's it's somewhere in the eight figure range and i mean and to, and to be okay. fair too i think part of it is the cannabis industry is in a really different time than it was two years ago or even yeah. post covid where yeah. uh, a lot of people probably see um mso stocks or oh no you're pulling, pouring it <laughs> Oh yeah. No, no, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Well, we've seen this. We've seen a contraction in the marketplace, and as you know, as cannabis continues to adopt into these legal markets and scale is growing, things change really quickly. And we've been profitable since around 2018, which is far better than I think a lot of our competitors. And this year, even yeah. though it's a most a lot of competitors and a lot of cannabis companies are struggling. This will be the most significant year of growth that we've had as an operation, which, um, you know, obviously wow. is, is really, really fantastic for us. And again, we had some really, really, we were very lucky early on in our, in our growth and we capitalized on it. So eight figures. We'll All, right. That. <laughs> All right. All right. Eight figures. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers to eight uh, figures. Cheers. <clears throat> cheers. Cheers. Oh man, I had almost forgotten how bad that was. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's been 15 minutes since our last shot, so yeah, that I one your I, body kind of forgot. Yeah, I instantly that one got you sweating for sure. Oh. Shirts coming off. Oh man, shirts yeah. coming off. Whew. I can't. I only have a t-shirt, so I, unfortunately, this is, I cannot. I can't. I can't reduce my temperature anymore um, if, if I don't want to get canceled. So, fair enough. All right. So one percent of revenue. You guys are in eight figures. Something. Something in the eight figure range. Um, so of all the different, um, you you have, we talked a little bit about brand building. Mm -hmm. um, last time we chatted a couple of weeks ago and you had some interesting things to say. You said something along the lines of, um, and you said it today actually too, if you have to pay someone to care, you probably aren't building your brand. Right. And so many, but so many people, so many companies are, are relying on PPC and paid media to grow their, their brand and their company. So how would you go about doing it? I know obviously, mm -hmm. Theory of wellness, you guys are doing very well. But if you were to, if someone came up to you right now and they're looking to build their brand, um, like uh, maybe a CMO friend, how would you advise them? Like, what tips would you give them? How can you build a brand today in 2023? Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of it just starts with what is the product you're creating and what value does the product have to the consumer that they don't already have? And if you can start to fill a white space around a product category or multiple product categories, that's step one. Understanding how you want that product to be received, the type of people you want to enjoy it, and starting really from a very basic infrastructure of what is the mission of what you want to do and how do you want to do it. Um, and we have a lot of internal conversations about, you know, from day one, what was it that we're trying to build here? I mean, what do we, what are we really trying to build with theory and I think asking that question, not just one time, but always kind of coming back to it, is this, is what you're doing in alignment with, is it serving the goal of what the operation wants to achieve? And so for us specifically, <clears throat> we, we kind of, because we're in this interesting niche space where, um, you know, we have retail stores that carry not just our products, but 
have a lot of other people's products. Um, we're product manufacturers where we have, you know, somewhere I think between 70 SKUs across edibles, vapes, flour, you know, everything under the sun, you know, some of the beverages that we make, high five beverages, we have this really wide gamut. And so you're always kind of listening to your consumers and guests and trying to get a feedback loop of is what we're thinking about in terms of the vision of the company meeting the expectations of our guests and patients? If yes, okay, good. How can we challenge ourselves to increase that ability to satisfy a consumer base or a guest base? And we do a lot of different things where we'll, you know, when we launch a new product, we'll start with a beta test. We'll automate feedback emails to those guests to get their perspective. We'll isolate the top consumers in a category for specific feedback. And then we'll get their insight into whether or not they enjoy the product, yes or no. If not, how can we improve upon it? And so we try to build a lot of everything around authenticity, where we don't want to be in the ivory tower saying, this is the product that everybody's going to want. We're like, okay, well, we have this very robust process where not only we're we getting feedback from our guests coming into the stores, but we also have this massive product feedback loop where when we decide to go into a product category, I'll do you know a ton of SEO research around white space. Does this product exist in the market? Yes or no. If it does exist, can we build a better mousetrap? mousetrap? Is this something that we know our consumers and guests are looking for? If we're not sure, we'll survey them and ask them, are you interested in this? And again, a lot of what we do is we have an intuition and we have an idea of where we want to go, but then we validate that against the people who matter the most, which is our guests, our customers, and also our staff too. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is, I think one of the references that I used when we were chatting a few weeks ago was, <clears throat> I always kind of refer to us not as like a, if we were a baseball team, we are, you know, you've used this analogy before, but we're not a team that's looking to hit home runs. You know, we're actually an on-base percentage team yeah. where we want to get very disciplined about data fidelity, feedback loops, make sure our CRM is not grinding people down. We're making sure that we're sending messages to people that are relevant, timely, not overwhelming. And a lot of those messages become two-way streets where they can give us feedback. And, you know, they also will come in and love to know if we have $100 ounces. And so we've built this really interesting ecosystem in which we have a really strong fidelity base of data in our data integrations and a really good marketing tech stack. And we spend more time talking about our tech stack and making sure that our baselines are accurate. I see a lot of brands who want to launch a new product every other week and they're under sub brands and it becomes really complicated to manage a portfolio oh, that's yeah. all branded differently. And so, you know, we've, we've been very disciplined about our approaches and we very seldom take what I call these big swings. Um, we, you know, we are very calculated when we take those risks, but I'm more excited about seeing a 40% open rate on a 200,000 person email list than I am, you know, coming up with the next big, like Same. celebrity project with a cannabis brand that doesn't make a ton of business sense aside from it's an interesting idea. And so we've been very focused to make sure that our priorities lie in the state of acceleration of business and velocity of sales. And that prevents us from going off on some weird tangents. We do still go off on weird tangents here and there, but we try to stay very, very disciplined. And a lot of that comes back to this concept of building a brand of authenticity that's not trying to sell you a false bill of gold goods. Dude. I wanted to respond to you in minute one and then minute two and minute three. Everything that you said there was like, holy shit. I was like, oh, shit. but I just didn't want to interrupt you. I appreciate that. I hope that was too long-winded. Three things. Yeah. yeah. No, three things I really want to touch on. The idea of authenticity, building a brand mm -hmm. that's authentic. I feel like that's what people are yearning for. Mm -hmm. um, people want to be see seen as people and not just another customer. Mm -hmm. Right? Um Communication, so important. Having some kind of medium for exchanging communication because it's hard because you're a business mm -hmm. and then you have customers. Has people, I don't know, we lost touch of the people, the people element yeah. of build, building a business. At the end of the day, you're selling to another person. You're not, they're not just another uh, customer number on right. your on your CRM system, right? Right. Yeah. So that, and then I want to touch a little bit upon emails. 
I feel like if your email open rates, your email open rates can tell a lot about how strong your brand is. Mm -hmm. Because if your email open rates are like 10%, less than 10%, that means people don't give a crap about what you're doing <laughs> or you're segmenting incorrectly. You're, you're launching a product that is, that is made, like I'll use cannabis for example, you're launching a product that is targeting your 20 year olds, but you're, you're, but you're emailing your 20, 30, 40, 50 and 60 year olds. Mm -hmm. So segmenting, so important. Yeah. Where, where do you want to dive first? Dude, we can nerd out about this for yeah. like, like <laughs> actually, 10 minutes here. I'd actually love to start with the people to people thing because actually in cannabis, that is massive because, you know, one thing that we were always really, really bullish on was making sure that if somebody had a question or had an, had wanted to learn more about something, that there would always be somebody on the other end of the line. And so that's actually, yeah. you bring this up is awesome because customer service actually lives under marketing, which is a little atypical for, I think, a lot of larger companies. And the reason for that yeah. is because every opportunity to dispel a myth or turn the course of a bad guest interaction or patient interaction, those folks become the biggest loyalists. And so they're the biggest opportunities for, for building that true connection with your customers. Brand, and, brand building, that's, that's all brand. Yeah, right. and we have a we have a very talented customer service team that fields a ton of inquiries across really complex subject matters. And they, you know, I was very passionate when I was, you know, a few years ago when we were like, okay, we're so big now, we actually need customer service people. And there was a time where I was doing it. I mean, I would actually, you know, be responding to Facebook messages and Google messages mm -hmm. myself at night and just even the CEO, Brandon, would yeah. be answering too. And, you know, and, and we realized that, the, hey, that's actually something we want to hold on to because this is a new industry. 100%. People have a lot of questions. And if you're not there for your customer, then what kind of a brand loyalty relationship are you creating? And so, you know, within the spirit of that, we've kind of taken that approach to, you know, our retail scores, our chief of operations, Scott Lee, is this incredible leader with these retail teams who are, you know, have uh, honestly the most outstanding service skills that I've, I've seen, obviously I'm part of the company, but they're incredible at what they do. And so, you know, that starts to bleed into good segue into the CRM. And with our CRM, we've been really, really thoughtful and we try to be really thoughtful about when are we sending messages? What is the frequency of the sends? What is the tonality we're using? You know, are we are we getting too aggressive on multiple sends? Are we segmenting the right audiences? Are we creating really good automations for retention and winbacks? Are we building really good conversion funnels that are thoughtful and direct to the point? And so we we've taken a lot of that mentality across the board into marketing where Part of the, my team is fantastic in terms of getting the right cadence, getting the right frequencies to reach our guests. And um, we still maintain really low unsub rates. We still have really high opt-ins. We still have, we're still seeing growth. What's in, your unsub rate? Oh, man, I actually, I would tell you if I know it, but I don't know it offhand, but I think it's like point. It's like point zero something. I mean, it is incredibly low. So yeah, I mean, it's way That's under amazing. one percent. Yeah, and again, yeah. like we always, we always treat this like, are we? What we don't want to be is the annoying friend in your friend group who's always reaching out to you and like doesn't get the hint. And so we're exactly. always, <laughs> so we're always like, there are certain times where we're all like, okay. X competitors email and SMS are going to hit us right now in this meeting. And then all of a sudden our phones blow up and we're like, it's so predictable. And so, you know, we've tried to, we've tried to kind of temper that a little bit. And I think guests and patients nowadays, I think with all of privacy and the things that are happening with cookies kind of going down and this kind of push for making sure that you're saying things at the right time, I think we're trying to use that tone of voice and build that relationship with our guests. And it seems to be working. So the far. fact that you're, the fact that you're using uh, friends as an analogy to talk about your customers <laughs> just shows that you really treat your customers as human. And yeah. I think 
we lost touch of so much of that. I think I, it's going to seem like I'm a huge hater of performance marketing, but I'm not. <laughs> I, I love, I feel like performance marketing yeah. and advertising, it is a tool. It is a For tool sure. to connect people that you would have never met before. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like using dating apps, right? Sure. Like you know, Tinder, Hinge, and all that. You yeah. would have never met these people had you not used this tool. But once you start the conversation, if you're treating every single one of your the people that you're talking to as leads, you will talk to them as leads. Like yeah. I, I don't really like the word leads. These are people that are interested in what you're talking about. And these yeah. are potential friends. I will call yeah. them potential friends instead. <laughs> yeah. And you would never, you would never annoy a friend, right? Yeah. But you would annoy a lead. Yeah. I that's mean, how we, we were, that's how we were taught. Totally. And we've actually, I've actually had conversations with our CEO, Brandon, about do we call them consumers, guests, visitors? Like we've had conversations about this to make sure that we're framing the folks that build us like in the right way. And it's really funny because we yeah. went back and forth on this. And those are the things that we challenge ourselves to have those conversations, even though some people probably think we're crazy for spending 15 minutes to talk about what's the difference between a guest and a consumer. Well, a guest is somebody who's mm-hmm. showing up to the retail store who needs to be treated in a way that you treat a guest. However, as soon as they leave the store, they are then consuming our products. And so are they consumers or are they guests? Yeah. So, but we still want to make sure we're like, putting ourselves in the guest's shoes and the consumer's shoes to make sure we're understanding. Yeah. Love this, man. I think we can nerd out about this for hours, but (laughs) I want to talk a little bit about authenticity and then I want to move on to to a few other ones. Authenticity is a huge differentiator right now in business because a lot of people for for the longest time was, was not authentic. Um, AI bots, like AI tools, filtering with images, but like people and I, uh, COVID also separated us as for humans sure. for a couple of years. And now everyone's yearning for that authentic connection and authentic connection, not just with people, but with brands. Mm-hmm. Uh, we recently had a company called Midday Squares. Uh, they, they, I don't know if you heard of them. They sell chocolate uh, and they started kind of similar to, similar time as you guys. And they grew to 40, they're selling $40 million worth of chocolate bars because what they do is they share, they share all the behind the scenes, everything, even, even when their founder had, uh, went to see a therapist, uh, therapist because they had internal fights between the founders. They shared that session with the therapist. Like they are sharing everything, the behind the scenes of how they built the company and consumers resonate with that. And they've grown, Chocolate bar, that, that's a very competitive industry. Yeah. It's very similar to you guys, and they've grown a lot. Talk to us about how you guys think about authenticity and how you and that how that shows up in your marketing and your conversations with your uh, consumers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it's like, you can't really put your finger on how to be authentic. It's not like there's a playbook that you can hand off and be like, this is the playbook for authenticity. Um, yeah. I think yeah. it's like, it's one of those yeah. things, like the harder you try to be authentic, maybe the least, the less authentic you become. The, the less. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, I think where, where our, our, there's like a little bit of like humbleness and authenticity from us is that I don't think every day, I think we all come in and we're like, damn, it's great that we get to be doing this. You know, and I think everybody, mm. there's like a colloquial feeling at our company at times where it's like, we're not selling mufflers. We're literally selling cannabis and this is like the coolest thing. And we never also projected to grow in the way that we have. It's been serendipitous, but I think the, the ability to like be authentic, I think is like very simple for us. Right. So there are a lot of people in cannabis who came to cannabis because they wanted to get into the green rush and they saw weed as the next big CPG product. And, you know, they went into it with the wrong reasons. I can say with, you know, with no shadow of doubt that Nick and Brandon, our two founders, got into it with the right reasons is because they wanted to build a really, really high quality craft cannabis brand. And that was always from day one, that was the brief to me was, we want to just be really, really thoughtful about our products, about the way we work with guests, 
We looked at a lot of analogous brands. Um, craft beer industry is a big one. Um, some really uh, retail apparel companies like Patagonia, who clearly have a vested interest in what they're doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've never really taken our foot off the gas on that. And a lot of it, too, is because we don't have a major board of directors. There's no strings attached. There's no nobody's really like grilling us on, you know, our revenue and all of these things. I mean, those are things that you can be really. Except for me. At. Yeah, except for you. This is the first time I've actually been asked these questions, which is so hilarious. Where <laughs> I was like, I talked to our CEO and I was like, Brandon, I don't think this is he's like, yeah, no way, dude. No, no way. Not a chance. But I think that's kind of where we're, we're we don't really, you know, I think if you're if you're focused on making really good products and you're focused on making a really good experience, like everything else will follow suit. And if you start with looking yeah. at bottom lines and being like, OK, we want to hit this margin or we want this EBITDA flow through rate or these are the you know, these are all the things that become your KPIs. Like our KPIs are we have all the standard KPIs, but ours are are we having really good guest engagement scores? Are we are our products moving really well in wholesale? Um, are we making and introducing people to things that they didn't get to have previously? And I think everybody knows in our company that, you know, myself, our CFO, our two founders, our COO, we're all accessible. We're always going around to different facilities. We're meeting with teams. We are not a massive high, you know, there's not a massive org chart. It's a relatively flat group. And I think because of that, people know us well and they know what our intentions are and they know what we're trying to do, which is just, we're just trying to make the cannabis industry that like we as passionate cannabis consumers want. And that's really, I think comes back to this element where we don't have, we're not publicly traded. We don't have stock prices. CNBC is not writing about, you know, our stock declines or buybacks or anything like that. We're kind of in our own little bubble where it's like, Hey, like we just mm -hmm. are going to continue on the path that we're on, which is make really good products provide a really good experience, be very respectful to our guests and patients, and honestly continue to do like really fun stuff that I think most people at Theory would agree what we're doing is fun and it's exciting. Not without its hardships, but I think that's where the authenticity really comes from us because we're not a big faceless corporation. Although some people see us as that still in the marketplace, but at a certain point- of course, gonna, there's always gonna be those people. Yeah, with the economy of scale and our, our our trajectory of growth, it's been, you know, we've held really close to that. And I think at times, too, we talk a lot about a lot of our kind of exec level discussions today are around, are we scaling consciously and are we scaling in ways that we're maintaining the integrity of what we set out to do? And when you get to our size and you start to make waves the way that we have a lot of opportunities come through um and we've you know staved off and chosen not to go in certain directions that have been open to us mostly because of the integrity of what we're building and again that's yeah. a point of discipline and knowing who we are and where we want to go and is that on the strategic roadmap and so i think that's inherently creates a sense of authenticity so yeah i hope that answers yeah. the question I, I it's it. pretty I... tangential but yeah, of course. I think at the end of the day, like I know it sounds it's so cliche, but it just seems like after this conversation, it was several conversations with you, you and the founders just care. You yeah. guys just care. And there's no way to, I know we all want to, you know, me, even me as a host, like as a host of a podcast, I want to find all these KPIs to quantify <laughs> what does care mean. But yeah. at the end of the day, man, if you care, you will always make, make the right, right moves. And yeah. I love, uh, you know, I want to ask one more question and then one more question and we'll move on to another segment. Sure. Um, but you, you mentioned authenticity. We talk about authenticity a lot and just like really curious, man, like, like how much do you make as a CMO? <laughs> Definitely not answering that. <laughs> Has anybody ever answered this question? This is yeah. Just an, yeah. Wait, we've, really? we've had, we've had shit. yeah, we've had one answer. We had yeah. the, the ex CMO of Mattel, uh, Barbie, Damn. she came on. She's now the CMO of a company called Wella, and they're like a billion dollar company. She answered because she wanted people to know what to, uh, how to value themselves. Like that was her message. Wow. Um, so, anyways, so that's a shot. Yeah, we'll skip this for this one, but we'll we'll get you back on for uh, for Great. 
you know, round two, maybe next year, <laughs> and, then, and then maybe you can spill the beans then. Yeah, we'll see. I doubt it, though. All right. <laughs> All right. Cheers. I had a whole speech and every- oh. That's horrible, dude. <laughs> I had a whole, I had a whole speech and everything. I thought, I thought I got you for a second. Like I had a whole thing prepared, and I wanted to slip in the question, so you wouldn't recognize it. And I thought you would just like, you know, just, just slip out there, but um, didn't get you there. No. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to another segment. Uh, so have your water ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna. These, these clips have done really well for our podcast, so we want to just keep going down this path. For sure. I'm going to tell you three, da- three dad jokes, um, like dry <laughs> jokes um, that are going to be kind of marketing related. And so I'll tell you these three jokes. If you laugh, if you can successfully not laugh for all three of the jokes, I'll take a shot of hot sauce. But if you laugh at any one of them, you'll take a shot. We're not doing three different shots. It would just be like one each. Does smiling count as a laugh or does it actually have to be a vocal laugh? A vocal laugh, like sound, like a sound. All right. Just just make no sounds. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you're going to go stoic on me because you really don't want to take a shot. Just the opposite. When, When somebody tells me not to laugh, that automatically triggers me to want to laugh. So... I would have been better off with just the dad jokes, Rob, but let's do it. Okay. All right. But you got to look at the screen because you got to look mm-hmm. at my delivery. All right. Where did the serial killer hide his dead bodies? I don't know. Page two of Google search results. Good one. Okay. Okay. All right. Two more. Two more, and then you're safe, and then you're home free. Um, okay. Why did the marketer get fired as a tap dancer? Marketer, tap dancer. Why did he get, why did he get fired? She kept wanting to get paid per click. Oh, man. That's a bad joke. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So hopefully you haven't heard of this one. This one's the best joke. All right. You got one more and then you're good. So, okay. I didn't, I don't know if I told you, but last year I started a monkey breeding business, but it failed because I was only using male chimps. That one was the best one for sure. Damn. All right. You oh. didn't laugh. All right. See, the last okay. one though. All right. Uh, yeah, the last one. We we actually got we got kicked off of Mailchimp because we were a cannabis company. So I'm a little salty about them generally. Yeah. Well, Mailchimp, honestly, most uh, most mailing platforms will kick you off. Yeah. Um I've I've I worked at a cannabis company for a little bit and we had to switch over to we had to kept keep switching, and we started using European mm-hmm. mailing servers because they're yeah. more open, they're more cannabis um, friendly. Um, all right, cheers! I lost. Cheers. All right. Do they get so better? We got about or five w- minutes left. Do they get better or worse for you? Looks like it's getting worse. The, the shots. Yeah. It's getting bad because I didn't take. Uh, I didn't eat any food. Um, which is probably not the best but it's it's habanero only so it's fine but like this for example this what this green uh, bottle is uh carolina reaper so if i had that now i yeah i would be dead rough so we got five minutes left before we but before we hop off um for the listeners that made it all the way through obviously they're interested in your background they're interested in the things that you've said and they made it all the way through. They just want to learn more about your background, your upbringing. Like they want to be you right? <laughs> or learn from you. So what was life like growing up? 
Like, <laughs> were your parents very entrepreneurial? You know, yeah. did you learn a lot from your parents? Like, did they push you along the way? Did you have a lot of mentorship from them, or yet, like, you had a rich uncle that 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 helped you along the way, or whatever? Like, what was life like for you growing yeah, up? Yeah, it's so funny. What a question. Um, yeah, I was I was super lucky. My parents, my mother was a watercolor artist and uh, was a painter, but also a, a ton of different talents. My dad actually ran an ad agency when I was a kid, and uh, growing up, he ran. Oh. Yeah, he ran. You know, he had done a bunch of, he had done a ton of campaigns, which originally I thought were, you know, things with like Spalding and the NBA and just these really, a lot of, very aligned to what my interests were as a wow. kid growing up. And so I was always, I always started to understand and get very curious about brands and what they meant. And so my dad, you know, really built this awesome agency and I kind of grew up and I was like, oh, this is really like, this is really cool. You're understanding the psychology of people and providing them with these things. And, and so, you know, I was as a kid growing up, though, I was a really into athletics, super competitive, was, was a mediocre mm -hmm. student. I was good when I worked hard, but I never really worked hard. And, you know, my parents super <laughs> really, really fostered, you know, me being pretty independent with my life. I was a creative writing and poetry major in college with like just shy of a minor in business, just shy of a minor in theater, just shy wow. of a minor in history. And so I kind of did a lot of different things. And, um, you know, generally speaking, I was very fortunate to have an upbringing where my parents were just kind of like, go do whatever you are interested in, go discover yourself. They're both hippies. So they kind of had this very, you know, <laughs> like hippie capitalistic view where it was like, oh, carve your own destiny, do what you like, do what you find interesting, you'll find your way. Yeah. Never told me what to do, but kind of just helped course me through certain things. And so I was very fortunate in that regard. And mm -hmm. I have two older siblings. Um, one lives in Australia, lives the dream, hangs out in the Gold Coast and is an awesome husband. My brother is also a CMO um, and he, you know, is a Oxford executive MBA program. 10 times smarter than I am. Wow. It's probably worth bringing on the program for a compare and contrast to me. So I was uh, really, really yeah. fortunate. Yeah, make the intro. Yeah, make I will. Intro. Yeah, he's, um. so, you know, I was very fortunate with my upbringing. Um, and, you know, and they basically let me, I was always a cannabis user, which is also funny when I was 15, 16, first started using cannabis, was still captain mm. of three sports, graduated with high honors, you know, got in early wow. to college, you know. Which sports? Uh, I was a uh, cross country skiing was one of them. I was really, really, that okay. was one of my big sports, tennis and soccer, um, played tennis freshman year of college, decided was not interested in competing anymore. Um, but was also, also an entrepreneur around tennis. I was a tennis instructor for years, used to string rackets, you know, I was loved wow. to hustle um, in my childhood and, but, you know, and honestly, my competitive edge, I've realized competitiveness for me is not about everybody else. It's about being competitive with myself. And that's something that I certainly grew into yes. as years went on. And we actually talked yes. about that a lot with theory. Yes. Our number one competitor yeah. is not the person who's selling down the street. It's competing with ourselves yeah. to raise the bar on what we do. And that mentality is certainly one mm -hmm. that I, was fostered for me. So. Oh man, I love that so much. Um, so now, now that you're CMO, five years in, things are going well. You guys are having record-breaking years now. What does success look like for you personally, though? Not from not from theory standpoint, but for you. Like, what would you want to achieve in the next kind of twelve months that you haven't achieved? Or like, you don't have to say like a, It could be like. You know, you, you want to run a, a massive ca cannabis conference. Like, what, what would a big success for you be, like, from a personal standpoint? Man, um, you know, I think this is so hard to answer. Um, I'm always somebody who kind of takes pleasure in where I'm at in life, and I've always tried to do that. Um, I would say... What would be really, really awesome is to see, uh, you know, to find kind of this 
to continue to kind of grow this this thing we're building and um and to really embrace kind of this wild run knowing that nothing lasts forever and to try to enjoy yeah. every bit of this as it continues um mm. and i think yeah. for me personally every day is a day of learning and education and so if i can continue to learn and educate you know that's really what i'm what i'm looking for is to can you continue my growth relatively young as a cmo and so i know that there's a lot that i haven't seen before but i'm building the experience to continue to grow personally intellectually I have a lot of intellectual curiosity. And so I think in the next couple of years, I hope I can kind of have the same answer, but with a different framework of yeah. variables. I love that you say that you're young uh, as a 36-year-old CMO. A lot of people uh, that reach out to me nowadays uh, regarding the podcast and, you know, and just my where I'm at in life, uh, they're younger. And you, you, it wasn't too long ago when you and I were, we're roughly the same age. I'm 30, 32. Yeah. It wasn't so long ago where I felt like, what am I doing in life? I better yeah. start moving fast before I miss the train. Not knowing that we're still young. If you're in your twenties and your early thirties, you still got so much time. Just keep, <laughs> keep growing. Right. Yeah. And then you'll, you'll get there. Uh, are you learning anything? You, you mentioned learning. Constant yeah. learning. Are you learning anything Constant. new? Are you dabbling in AI? Like, like, what are you the most passionate about right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in the impact of AI in search right now. I'm really interested in how AI is going to start yes. to impact our customer service too. Um, that's something that like I'm really intrigued by. Um, I think AI in general is something that I've been really, really curious about how it's going to start to manifest itself. Um, so. I've been yeah. doing a lot of reading up on that. I've been reading up a lot on some of Sam Altman's blogs and kind of where he's been talking about GP, uh, GPT and kind of where it started, where it's going. Um, so I, I think AI is something that I'm trying to keep some eyes on without being too, I think a lot of people are very sensationalist about it. I'm not quite there, but I'm curious to see the future of it. Um, and then honestly, I'm a big fan of reading historical biographies. Um, and so I read yeah. a lot of history books because I find even though the problem sets are different, the feelings and emotions and the courage and the thoughtfulness and the intellectual capital is all the same from certain types of leaders, whether it's Jobs, Oppenheimer, um, you know, even... Uh, you know, guys like Stephen Ambrose writing these fantastic novels of these historical accounts of these just front runners in terms of what we're doing today, where I'm constantly mm. trying to digest history to understand the future in a certain way, where it's almost like work backwards and try to understand skill sets. And well, they say, works. well, they say history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right? Yeah, precisely. It, it all, it's very similar. Yeah. And so I find I find a lot of interest in reading a lot of you know trying to read as much history as i can to try to get contextual framework um there's nothing more sobering than reading about world war ii and realizing that my grandfather was overseas fighting in a war while i'm sitting at a desk editing nug shots and so i try to keep a little bit of just grounded realism about where i am um and so you know i like to yeah. balance further education whether it's about you know talking to some of our leaders here about things like forecasting and just getting deeper into executive level business and really getting both feet in, asking a lot of questions, continuing to look at the emergence of the cannabis industry, the different fields that we have, planning for when things go legal and understanding how does that impact my business that was not a CPC business, but will someday become one. And so my intellectual curiosity brings me all over the place. And so um, I like to keep a fine balance of knowing you know knowing what great, great leaders look like have looked like knowing how decision making can look in tough times but also starting to discover um what does the future look like and trying to play a little bit of a chess game there so it's a balance of kind of two worlds yeah amazing amazing well man this has been an ab absolute pleasure uh feels like we're just sitting down on the couch <laughs> just grabbing a beer and just chatting. I really appreciate the vibes. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate you. 
we'll definitely have to come back and do round two. Maybe get your brother out. Maybe we can do like three of us chatting. Maybe <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, for for the people that are listening, they want to learn more about you. Where can they? Like, where are you most uh, most most present in, in terms of social? Yeah, I don't have a ton of time on social, but I am on LinkedIn. Thomas Wynn Stanley. You'll find me at Theory Wellness under that company. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Thomas R. Wynn Stanley. Um, yeah, and if you honestly, if you reach out to our customer service channels and say you're looking for Thomas for marketing, they will put you in touch with me, ironically, as well. Whoa. So. Wow. Okay, brother. Thank you so much for jumping on. We'll, yeah. we'll have to chat very, very soon. Thank you so much. Hey, man. I appreciate it. Hey, hope you enjoyed that episode. I know I did. My mouth was burning on fire for about 30 minutes there. So I had to take a quick break before I recorded this. But I really just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. Most of us work at home nowadays and we're all just in our pajamas, in our t-shirts and in our hoodies. It just feels really fun and really light. And that's the kind of vibe that I'm trying to give. If there's anything that you want to add into the show, new segments or new topics to talk about, feel free to throw it into the comments below. Thank you so much again. Would not be here without you. Your support. Until next time, peace out. Hope to see you soon.